Hello, and welcome to the latest episode in Emory University's Health Storytelling Project, a Q&A series with authors of fascinating new books about health and science. I'm Marin McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University, and I'm the curator and host of this series. In a moment, I'll introduce you to my guest, medical anthropologist Teresa McPhail and her fascinating book, Allergic, Our Irritated Bodies in a Changing World. But first, let me tell you about this series. At least once per month during the academic year, we invite writers whose journalistic or academic books examine health, the science and history of health, and health's intersection with society. This series of conversations originates at the Emory Center for the Study of Human Health. We're also fortunate to have three amazing co-sponsors, the Georgia Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Library of Congress, Science Gallery Atlanta, which presents exhibits that live at the juncture of science and art and ignite creativity and discovery, and the much-loved Decatur Book Festival, the largest independent book fair in the United States. Book fans may know that the festival is taking a post-pandemic hiatus to rethink its goals and strategies, and in that pause, we're delighted to bring these authors in our series to the festival's passionate supporters. Now let me tell you about this series. Our theme in this half year is how our health is determined by forces and systems beyond our control, whether that's the built environment or the legal system, changes in weather and climate or research agendas that choose what is and is not studied and how we negotiate those systems to protect our health or how we don't. Tonight, as I mentioned, I'm in conversation with medical anthropologist Teresa McPhail about her book, Allergic, Our Irritated Bodies in a Changing World, published by Random House. In January, I spoke to investigative journalist Jesse Singer about her book, There Are No Accidents, The Deadly Rise of Injuries and Disaster, Who Profits and Who Pays the Price, published by Simon & Schuster. And finally, on Wednesday, April 3rd, I'll be speaking to journalist and athlete Christine Yu about her book, Up to Speed, The Groundbreaking Science of Women Athletes, which was published by Riverhead Books. This series is live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, and LinkedIn, and archived on YouTube. We're also now streaming live to Instagram for the first time. And one final note. If you're watching us on February 28th, you are experiencing a live event. You can interact with us by commenting on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn, or replying on Twitter. X. If you do, our producer Stefan Kaplan of Spin It Social will make sure we see what you've said and will put your question up on screen when I pose it to our guest. We're working on comment integration for Instagram as well. Do note that I'll turn to your questions in the second half of this 60-minute live stream, but you can put in your questions in the comment boxes or by replying at any time. Now, let's turn to our book and guest. Teresa McPhail is a medical anthropologist and an associate professor of science and technology studies at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. She's also a former journalist, which I, of course, find delightful. She studies global health, medicine, and disease, and holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Teresa, welcome to this series. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So the first thing that I have to point out is that I am sitting in Atlanta, which is infamous for its pollen every spring, to the degree that people call it the pollening. You can go out on the sidewalk and sweep the tree pollen up with a broom mm -hmm. and dustpan. It's terrifying. Uh, when I first moved here many, many years ago, uh, people asked if I had allergies and I said no. And they said, oh, you will. Um, and the second, and this is a personal thing, I, and I do, in fact, now have allergies. Um, but, the second, and this is a personal thing, is that I just want to salute you for writing a book about immunology, because I have been working for most of my career in epidemiology, and when I approach immunology, it breaks my brain. So yes. 
thank you <laughs> for engaging in all the very smart and clear and clever explanations you go into to make uh, immunology make sense for the average reader. Yes, when it sometimes often doesn't make sense to the people studying it, it can be quite a challenge. So when I told uh, people that I was going to be interviewing you and told them the title of your book, what I heard over and over again, and I'm sure you've heard this even more, is that everyone at this point knows someone who has an allergy. And everyone who has allergies thinks that their allergies are getting worse. Are those Pretty much. statements? <laughs> Um, pretty much. I mean, if you think about it, about 30 to 40 percent of the global population has some form of allergy. So either a respiratory allergy or skin or food allergy. And they expect those to rise to 40 to 50 percent in the next 20 to 25 years. So by the end of this, one in two people across the globe, and there really isn't anywhere Safe. If you think about, oh, are there people who are escaping the rise in allergies? The answer is really no. And as far as are they getting worse, the symptoms are getting worse for some people, especially respiratory because of climate change and environmental changes. So we are actually seeing changes in the pollen that's driving everyone to feel more miserable. Even if they had milder allergies before, they're starting to feel the effects of increases in pollen in the air. So I got us off on the track of pollen by talking about the pollening here in Atlanta, the, the literal green yellow storm that will be blowing past my door soon. But I one of the points that you make in the book that I'd love to hear you talk some more about is that it's not just pollen and it's not just food, that there that allergies are a, a symptom of so many things, of the environment and climate change and lifestyles and the built environment mm -hmm. and so many things that we have done have have created a rise in allergy. So unpack that for us. Oh, my goodness. I mean, this is exactly what the all the experts I interviewed kept telling me. You're going to try to tell the whole story of allergies. Good luck. <laughs> and this is why it's one of the most frustrating things is that everyone wants an answer. So. They usually want to know, are allergies getting worse, by which they mean, are they getting more prevalent and then more severe? And the answer is yes to more prevalent, um, yes and no on more severe, depending on the person. But the second question they always want to know is why? And that's a much tougher uh, thing to talk about because really, um, we've had some evidence that there's been allergy, like there ancient times. So, you know, an ancient Egyptian king probably died of anaphylaxis from a sting of a wasp. So we've had this capacity for a long time, but it wasn't until about 200 years ago, so the early 1800s, that we started to notice things like respiratory allergies, like your common hay fever, and saw the incredible rise of asthma and eczema and food allergy in the latter half of the last century. So if you think about everything that's changed in the last 200 years, um, the key is that our lifestyles change dramatically, our diets have changed dramatically. We have access to modern medicine, which has meant more antibiotics, which is gonna, gonna play a role in this story. Um, but we also have a lot of pollution um, and extraneous things that's coming into contact with our immune systems that we never would have had before, like plastics, some of the chemicals that we add into things like cosmetics and perfumes. So we're just exposing ourselves to a lot more things that didn't exist in nature in the past. And then we have subtracted a lot of the things that our bodies were used to like healthy bacteria. So those antibiotics accidentally have helped us wipe out good colonies. And we're hearing a lot about the gut microbiome. And that certainly plays a role in this story. And so you've got all of this stuff. And even uh, and this, this is a tangential thing, but I heard um, even some concern about maybe it's to do with vitamin D levels. So a lot of us don't have um, enough vitamin D in our system because we're inside a lot. We're not outside a lot. And so um, vitamin D plays a role in immune regulation. So perhaps that has something to do with it. 
So when you ask me why, I have to say all of the above. <laughs> so you just referenced some of the history of allergy, where sort of the, the science of, I'm not sure I'm going to say this correctly, allergology? Is it, allergology, is it a yeah. Allergology? <laughs> um, where, where it begins um, more than 100 years ago. But what was striking to me in reading that your account of that history is that though, as you say, um, the science of allergy, I'm going to go with that, uh, has has been able to elucidate more and more of the factors that may be creating allergic responses on a pretty fundamental scientific level, I was shocked to find that we don't really know how allergy works. Right. And so was I. I, I basically thought that defining allergies was going to be the easiest part of researching. And it turns out that that was one of the sticking points um, because our, the history of our understanding of the immune system is wrapped up in what you and I both traffic in, which is viruses and bacteria. So, you know, we start being interested in the immune system because of things like cholera and TB and um, early vaccines. And so when they first started noticing allergic reactions, it was in relationship to um, kids getting uh, vaccinated for something like smallpox. And so they would notice a uh, rash and irritation and perhaps a light fever uh, in some children that were getting repeated doses of this vaccine. And at first they thought that allergies were just a normal part of developing immunity. So they saw it on a scale, like a spectrum. So you would have to go through allerg allergic response to get what you wanted, which was immunity. Because at the time that we started noticing these reactions, I can't stress this enough, we thought the immune system could only do one thing, which is defend us. And the idea that it could accidentally harm us was anathema. I mean, it just was considered heretical. Like, how could you think that these cells that are so clearly protecting us are actually having a harmful effect? And so allergy science is kind of ignored for a couple of decades until it becomes clear that in fact our immune cells can harm us. And of course today, I'm sure there are people out there listening to this thinking, yeah, I have an autoimmune disorder. Like, yes, um, you know, this is a possibility. And so it took a while for that idea of the immune system as just defense to leave us so that, that we could start exploring um, more functions of immune cells. And I think at this point, we're still discovering new ones, to be honest. So it, it's fascinating, as you say, you know, the the, the, dis, the recognition of immune disorders has made it clear that our immune systems are not always our friends. And yet at the same time, that makes no sense. As you talk about in the book, it's uh, allergy is a maladaptive response. It may at some point have defended us against the environment, but now it is turning our bodies against ourselves. Right. And I think it's the confusion. So one of the things to know about the immune system is it's one of the oldest parts of us. And so mammalian uh, immune systems started developing around 250 to 500 million years ago, depending on the part that you're talking about. So mast cells, which uh, release histamine, which is why you're getting sneezy and itchy and um, why you end up in anaphylaxis eventually is all because of histamine those cells are 250 to 300 million years old. And so one of the things that I talk about a lot is the mismatch between having an evolutionary process that is super slow in humans. So, you know, it takes us a while to procreate. And so we're less adaptive to the changes in our environment as something like mice or fruit flies, for instance. And so what's really happening is our immune cells were trained in a world that was pretty much the same for a long time. And then we started changing it dramatically, but our immune cells can't adapt that quickly. So it's like we're running Windows 95, but we need to Zoom. And, and that's anybody who's old enough to remember Windows 95 is gonna immediately recognize you're gonna have problems. <laughs> with that system. And that's really what's happening is that our cells are doing the job that they were built for in an environment that they were not built for. 
And that's the primary issue that you're seeing with the development and increase of allergic responses. I want to remind people who are watching that we would love to hear from you. Please um, ask questions in the comments on whatever platform you're watching on, and we will see them. As you saw, we just popped up a couple of greetings from folks who are watching from a variety of places. So, so for the past couple of minutes, Teresa, we've been sort of geeking out about the science, and that, of course, is amazing. But their allergy is so serious and often even deadly, and I would love to hear you talk about your own family history with allergy, which I assume brought you into this story and which is just so tragic. It, it brought me in, but decades later, which is surprising to some people, but I was very young when it originally happened. So when I was 24, my father was 47 and was driving in uh, his car on a summer day and happened to stop at a stop sign and he had his window rolled down and a bee that was just on its normal trajectory collecting pollen for that day flew in the window and they collided literally and the bee stung him in the neck and through a cascade of events, his cells overreacted. So all of us will react to bee, bee venom, like all of us will have some sort of reaction, but my father's reaction was outsized and he went into anaphylactic response and unfortunately this was the 90s so back then your the ambulance that showed up didn't have to have adrenaline they didn't have to have an epipen or anything of the like and it just so happened that the emts that showed up to rescue him did not have adrenaline on hand and so he ended up um, dying within 30 minutes of the sting, and he was dead on arrival at the hospital. And so a whole series of things just collided to have this outsized thing. And of course, um, years later, I started struggling with getting sick a lot and ended up at an ENT's office, and they scoped me, um, which is basically just sending a camera into your nose, ladies and gentlemen. And it, immediately when he, the camera was still in my nasal cavity, the ENT said, oh, you have allergy. And this was news to me because I never had, I had friends and family with respiratory allergies and they really struggled during pollen season. And I never really felt that bad, except that my immune system was responding locally. And after that happened, I kind of put two and two together and I started thinking, you know, what really are allergies? Did I inherit this from my father? Did, you know, do allergies just run in our families? Is it worse? And then I started talking to friends and family about all of this and the floodgates opened and I started feeling a bit like an, a priest in a confessional room because it, I think people just aren't often asked about their allergies. And so, I became a curious person and wanted to hear allergy tales and hear them I did. <laughs> I just got so many people telling me about their daily struggles. And that's when I started looking for the information that I ended up writing about, like, why are we struggling with this? What's going on? Um, how many people are we talking about? And that's what started my entire journey down this road was a very personal experience with losing a family member, which is unfortunately not that rare. I mean, we unfortunately lose several people every year to food allergies and asthma attacks. So I have an uncommon, common story. Oh, I'm so sorry. Something that's so fascinating in what you said about learning about your family is that your family, many members of your family had allergies, but they had different allergies. Right. And set in the book, you you use this to open up the puzzle of what the genetics of allergy actually are. Right. Uh, so what did you find out? So it turns out that uh, genetics are a small part of this story. So you inherit the genetic predisposition to having the potential to have allergy, but that doesn't necessarily mean you ever will develop them. Uh, and it doesn't mean, so if your dad has an allergy to shrimp, you might have eczema. Like that, that your, the type of allergy you develop 
will be a dance between your genetics and your environment. So it's going to play out differently, which is one of the reasons allergy diagnosis is so difficult because allergy response is so unique. So we're all the same in, in the sense that the allergic pathway, so that immune function is misfiring, but we're all unique in the type of response that it is, where it's happening in your body, and how how you're feeling it. So some folks will have a very mild food allergy, and other people are having the smallest, smallest trace of a peanut and finding themselves in the ER. And just looking at the genetics, I can't tell you who's going to be who. I can tell you that there are certain indicators that you might be more prone that are inheritable, but I can't tell you what that's going to look like or even if you will ever develop an allergy. And what that means in practical terms for you is you still don't know if you have a bee allergy, a bee venom allergy, right? That's correct because I'm I'm unfortunately unique in the following way. So some of us, so first of all, I think it's really important, I always try to stress this, the allergy tests that most of us get, so we'll get on our arm or on our upper back, we'll get the skin prick test. And what they're doing is delivering a small amount of the allergen underneath your skin to see if your mast cells produce histamine. And that's why you get the, the wealth if, if it does. But they're not testing allergy, they're testing sensitivity. Hmm. So those tests have a 50% false positive rate. They have a 95% accuracy rate for negative. So if you don't react, it's really likely that you are not going to be allergic to the thing. But if you see a huge welt on your arm for say tree pollen, and you're not experiencing allergies during tree pollen season, that could be because the cells in your nasal cavity are tolerating the pollen just fine, while the cells on your skin were not. And so it really doesn't tell us much. It just tells you what you're not allergic to. And unfortunately, for some of us, we have historically low levels of uh, the antibody that drives the allergic re immune response majority of the time, which is called IgE. It's one of the five types of antibodies that our bodies produce. And some of us just don't produce a ton of it to begin with, which means we're not going to react at all to those skin and blood tests because it's not gonna set off our response. And so that is my situation, which means there is a way that I could find out, Marion, but neither you and I would wanna do it. They would have to individually drop, they would have to drop a drop in my nose or my eye and see what happens. And as you can imagine, that's not something I want to do. I don't think that's a good idea, no. <laughs> yeah. We will, we will live with that mystery. Unfortunately, right. you will have to live with that mystery. So we've been talking a lot about about respiratory allergies and of course about about um, insect venom, but we should be sure to broaden this out to the the rest of the universe of allergy to to skin reactions, ATP, eczema. Uh, one of our our viewers has asked a question about eczema and also to food allergy, which I imagine is on the the minds of a lot of people who are watching this because right. the rates of food allergy and and particularly peanut allergy. For, um, for parents of young kids, for young kids who have worried parents, um, just seem to be going up and up all the time. And as right. one of your sources points out in the book, one of the mysteries of this is that people come up with food allergies at some point in their adulthood. They, don't, they, may, they may have had a perfectly normal life for a couple of decades and then suddenly, boom, there's right. an allergy. And we thought for years that wasn't even possible. Like mm -hmm. to go back to the fact that we're still learning a lot about the immune function. 20 years ago, an allergist, if you came into the office uh, saying, oh, I wasn't allergic to shrimp and now I'm 60 and suddenly I'm allergic to shrimp, they th would have dismissed you. They would have said, oh, you were always allergic or there, there was this idea that it wasn't a real allergy because um, we just didn't think adult onset happened. And now we know that it does in a lot of cases. But we're, again, not sure why your body would have tolerated something for 50 years and then just suddenly decided, nope. Um, but it goes the opposite way, too. I mean, some children outgrow their food allergies. So they develop the tolerance over time. And the truth is, we just don't know much about tolerance. What we do know a lot about is the underlying mechanism. So eczema patients are just having 
their skin is the reactive area. Asthma patients, it is their lung cells that are the reactive area. Um, and for food allergy, it is their gut and sometimes their skin. So for food, you and sometimes wheezing. But it's, it's basically where you are feeling the symptoms of the thing. But the underlying mechanism is usually triggered by that Ig antibody recognizing something it thinks is a problem, even though it's not, like a peanut protein, and then turning on the immune system. Which is why it's confusing. A lot of people will ask me, well, why do allergies have the same symptoms as COVID? And it's, well, that makes sense if you stop to think about it because you're turning on the immune system in both ways. It's just a different biological switch. So you're just using a different switch to turn on the same light. And so it can be really tricky. I mean, I'm sure some of the people watching this are thinking, yeah, every spring I pay, play that really fun game. Is it a cold or is it allergies? <laughs> and that, I hope that at least helps you. It's not going to help you solve the mystery of is it a cold or is it allergies? But that may explain why you're playing that game in the first place. Because in essence, your body is doing the same thing for both. So I want to go a little further with this idea of flipping the switch. Um, because I think a lot of people um, may have heard of the hygiene hypothesis. This, this question that has... I don't know, dogged immunology for, I don't know, 50, 60 years at this point of mm -hmm. where, uh, maybe longer, uh, of um, where at, where allergy or our tolerance of allergens come, come from. Uh, I will just mention again, as I said, I'm sitting in Atlanta. There's a very large nursery chain, plant nursery chain here, whose um, motto is come play in the dirt again. And every time I see it, I think of the hygiene hypothesis and and encouraging kids to roll around in farmyards um, or go to uh, to daycare with their younger brothers or older brothers and sisters. Anyway, tell us about the hygiene hypothesis older. and whether it works. OK, so it partially it is obviously partially correct, but it's not fully correct. And I'll walk us through that. So the hypothesis originally started when people uh, noticed an epidemiologist was doing a meta-study on uh, asthma and noticed that the risk for asthma seemed to go down in younger siblings. So when you looked at families, if a family had three or more children, and this was in the 80s, so there were more families with that situation, what this epidemiologist um, found was that it, it, the youngest sibling had the less least amount of allergic disease. And so he posited, well, isn't this interesting? What happens to younger siblings that might explain this effect? And his hypothesis is the hygiene hypothesis, which is perhaps those older siblings are bringing home infections and thereby training the younger immune system to tolerate more. And so when you look at studies that have been done in Switzerland and Germany are the gold standard hygiene hypothesis um, studies. So they looked at children who were brought up in and around barns with livestock mm -hmm. and versus children who lived in the same village that didn't have that exposure to livestock and the dust in barns. And what they found was if you were carried in and out of a barn, between the ages of birth and around two or three years old, your likelihood of having allergies is almost nil. But interestingly enough, the livestock is a key factor. So if you're in a barn without the cows and ducks and pigs, it's less protective. And so you might be thinking, well, this sounds like a smoking gun. Here we are, like they're getting exposure to dirt and animal dander, and there's something about that that's helping to train those immune cells to tolerate a lot more category of things, except that, you know, if you look at farmers in Nebraska, their rates of asthma are just as great as, mm -hmm. you know, there's not much of a difference. And so we have some contradictory type of evidence. Um, and we also, if you look at, um, there was a great study done in Uganda where people are still very much living uh, closer to the land, like they're farming, 
And if you go out and you test them for sensitivity levels um, and respiratory allergies, they're catching up to the rest of us. And so it can't just be that we're exposing ourselves to bacteria or viruses or animal dander or whatever is magical about barn dust. Um, it has to be something else also. And so um, that's where the, I'm going to anticipate that's where we're going. That's where the microbiome theory comes in. <laughs> so that's basically the idea that our gut microbiomes are also training our immune cells. Hmm. So the key, the key seems to be that your immune cells, and it's very early in life, it's from birth to around three. After three, your immune system is kind of done with the lesson. Um, it really does a lot of work in that time period. Not to say it's impossible to change your immune system after age of three, but it's much more malleable in those early years. And so what seems to be the key is the idea of training those, exposing your young immune cells to as many things as possible in a positive way, and then you learn to tolerate it. But Marin, we, we don't know what tolerance is. Mm. You know, the, the, that you mentioned that one of those studies took place in Uganda reminded me of something that I really wanted to hear you talk about, and, and I'm going to pop this in here before we get much further. And that is that in this history of the science of allergy that you unroll so beautifully, for so many decades, there's this sense that that allergy is something that happens to, to wealthy people right. and to people who are dominant in the culture. Um, and, and as you show in the book, that is not true. What's true is that other patients, people who are disadvantaged, people who are people of color, are have not been as visible to medicine, even though in many cases, they may be living in, in environments that are more allergenic than yes. the wealthy white people. So un unpack that, please. Yes. I mean, unfortunately, this goes back to the original discovery, if you will, of hay fever. And so in the early 1800s, the people coming in with summer colds, which is what they thought it was before we knew about allergic response, they were usually white, worried, and well. So they were doctors or lawyers or businessmen or teachers, and they, so they were relatively wealthy and they were struggling with respiratory allergies. And so the association that, and a lot of them were women, and so, or young boys. And so there was this idea that people who had allergies were perhaps neurotic and overeducated and primarily white. And that history is like a ghost in the present. Hmm. We now know that that's not true, but that association has lingered. And you can see it in the media, like in, in a show, a quick way to show that someone's a nerd is to have them puff on an inhaler or have a food allergy. And it's this idea that these people are neurotic and, and weak. And so that association has kind of lingered. But unfortunately, um, we know that if you live in an area close to diesel exhaust, for instance, so air pollution has a big role to play in this. If you have more um, cockroaches or more um, dust mites, like if you're living in an, in an environment that a, an apartment building where you can't really get away from that or ha maybe has mold, there's a lot of mold issues. Um, those children are more likely to develop allergies as they get older. And you're right, there's a socioeconomic dimension to this. Like think about who's living closest to the bus depot. It's probably black and brown bodies. And so this kind of association with especially food allergy, you know, the, to this day, uh, black and Hispanic children are dramatically underdiagnosed for food allergy. Hmm. And the reasons are one, um, they're not associated with food allergy. So again, there's this kind of historical after effect that we just weren't looking for food allergy with them. And then secondly, it's because of access to resources. So you have to have good health insurance and you have to be able to get to see a food allergist. And for many Americans, that is like saying, go to the moon. Mm -hmm. It may as well be that easy because they either can't afford the copay or their insurance won't let them see a specialist. 
And for eczema also, um, eczema has been historically hard because until recently, um, dermatologists were trained on white skin. And so you would see the, you know, the illustrations and the visualizations of something like eczema were always light skin. And, you know, eczema presents differently um, with darker skin tones. You have to learn how to recognize it. And now we're doing that. But we weren't doing that before. And so the diagnosis is kind of lagged behind um, in some of those groups. I sense in our, our viewers um, that they're loving that we're talking about the science, but what they'd really like to hear is what on earth do I do? Right. So, what, <laughs> what do I do to help myself? Can I do something with home remedies? Uh, one of our audience members has just asked about those. You do some de debunking in the book about home remedies that people talk about a lot, but you right. also do a deep dive into what some of the possibilities are for treatments. So let's get into that. Right. I mean, unfortunately, if you already have allergies, there's not much to be done. So this idea that you, you can perhaps, you know, you can see an allergist, you can perhaps do immunotherapy, which is gradually exposing yourself to small doses of the offending thing. People do immunotherapy for food, but they also do it in uh, cases of severe respiratory allergies, you can try immunotherapy for whatever it is you're allergic to. And they just try to build up the tolerance by slowly exposing those immune cells to minute parts of allergens and then building up. And it works for a lot of people, but unfortunately it doesn't work for a lot of people. And there's no good way to know who's who. And so you kind of, and it's very expensive and time consuming. So the best we have are symptom relief. So most people are probably taking an antihistamine or they're on a steroid. We do have some new drugs coming that are great, especially for eczema and asthma and food allergy. I mean, I'm sure everyone saw that Zolaire just got approved by the FDA for food allergy. Um, so we have some exciting new ways to interrupt that biological pathway that's turning on that immune response. But what can you do, like say you have young children or say you're planning to have children or say you just wanna make your immune system happy so you don't develop the, you wanna keep eating shrimp, I'm completely with you. There are some things you can do. Um, one is studies have shown just lay off the especially aerosol cleaners. So children that grow up in a household that's using a lot of Lysol spray, um, aerosol cleaning products, um, things like air fresheners, that is bad news. Hmm. Um, it irritates their, I don't know if you know this, but children breathe more rapidly, so they take more breath than us. Um, so they're getting more exposure to those sprays than you'd want them to. Also, you don't want to kill everything. We're so high. And, and it's hard to say this after COVID when everyone was like, buy your Lysol wipes and wipe everything down. But that's actually, it's counterintuitive, but you just need soap and water. We go too far with this kill 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria. And, you know, a little happy dirt is not bad for kids. I mean, the hygiene hypothesis isn't completely wrong. So erring on the side of, you know, making sure that you're not overdoing it on the cleanliness. Um, dogs help. If you have a dog in your household with a young child, they're less likely to develop allergies. We think it's because it's recreating that barn effect for them, that they're tracking in things, they have dander, so perhaps that's it. But things like you know, this idea, and I wish it worked, you guys. I'm about to ruin your lives. Eating local honey doesn't do a darn thing. I'm so sorry. to. T it's delicious. Keep doing it. But you would have to put it in your nasal cavity for it to do the job you want it to do. Because the idea would be you're introducing small amounts of the pollen to your system, but you're eating it. And that's not the cells that need that acclimation. It's your nose. So, and I'm not, please don't stick honey up your nose. <laughs> also, don't do that. But that really isn't going to help. Um, 
air purifiers will help clear out the pollen, but they don't do much for those fine particulate matter. So, and they don't do anything for things like nitrogen oxide, like some of the things that irritate our lungs, they don't do a darn thing and they might actually recirculate that stuff. So the latest stuff on whether or not you should use an air purifier is kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. It can actually make your system worse. I hate to say that. There are a couple of studies that showed it didn't do much at all. Um, so it's basically, um, you can change your diet. That helps um, more fruit and veg, more fiber. And that is something I, I'm not surprised, and you won't be surprised to hear, 93% of Americans don't get enough fiber. I mean, <laughs> right? I am sure you're doing a little like, did I have enough fiber? And probably not. <laughs> but but in the book, in the and toward the end of the book, you talk about be, beyond things that people can do themselves. It sounds it sounds to me as though uh, toward the end of the book, you're hopeful about some therapies that may be in the relatively near future. I will say right. it's shocking that we are still using therapies that they were using 100 years ago. Yes. But 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 there are profound questions about what they're going to cost, who's going to have access to them, who's going to who's going to benefit right. both on the development side and also on the social side. This right. is very complicated. Yeah, so I'll just use the example of Dupixent. So some of your viewers might be familiar with Dupixent already. So it's a quote unquote a miracle drug especially for those folks with severe eczema. And eczema is a really difficult allergic disease to treat. Often you don't know what triggers it and it can be really hard to get the immune system to tamp down the response. And for years and years and years, the only treatment was steroids. But steroids are really terrible long-term. So you can't be on them forever. People would have a rebound effect. So they would clear up when they were on the steroid, but then they would stop taking the steroid and have a flare up of the eczema, um, so they didn't like that. And also, you know, you have to be careful because, you know, you could potentially have liver and kidney damage, you, you thin your skin with the steroid cream. So it wasn't a great situation. So Depixin came along and I, I, so here's the difference, steroids turn off the immune system, they just turn it down. And so it turns off the immune system for everything. And Dupixent is more of a, a finely grained tool that is just turning off that pathway. It's called the IL-4 pathway. It's one of the ways your cells can trigger an immune response. And what Dupixent does is gets in there and says, nope, we're going to disrupt this chain of events. And so it's less damaging. They, it has fewer side effects, not none. There are side effects to Depixin as well, but they're less severe. And so that's really positive. Here's where it starts to get dicey. It's $5,000 a month. Oh. <laughs> and it has to be taken continuously. So you can imagine pharmaceutical companies are thinking, ka-ching, but insurance companies are going, ah, because you have to jump through a lot of hoops. They will make you try the other things first mm -hmm. because Dupixent is so expensive. And so you'll still have a pricey copay as well. So to go back to those socioeconomic differences, you know, if you're a single mom trying to raise two kids and one of them has eczema and needs this medication every month, and even if it's only $40, knowing that that's every month might be out of your capability. So, you know, pharmaceutical companies have programs where they have, try to help people with these costs, but it, that's not a great long-term solution, um, especially when you think about how many people might need them both now and in the future. So this problem isn't getting any better. If anything, it's just going to get worse. Astonishingly, we're coming close to the end of the hour, and there are two things, and they're sort of linked, that are in the book that I was hoping to hear you talk about. And the first is the this this sense, and you say it several times um, at different points in the text, that that allergy and the rise of allergy is kind of like an alarm bell for 
for ways that are for our immune systems, but also for our environments and for climate change. And I would love to hear you talk about that. And then I have a follow up question. Yeah. So I often say that uh, allergy sufferers are the canaries in the climate change coal mine mm -hmm. because we often think that we're only affecting the outside world. We don't think that the changes that are happening environmentally are affecting our inside world, but they are. Um, so like the pollen is a great example uh, because climate change has changed the pollen significantly. So it's changed the protein structure. There's more pollen in the air. You're not mistaken. There's more of it than ever because some plants like ragweed, for instance, absolutely love the combination of pollution in the air because it's getting nitrogen, which is usually a limit, like plants need nitrogen to grow, but it's limited amount in the soil, not if there's nitrogen in the rain. So you're getting that limit. So there's ragweed everywhere. So there's more pollen just because there's more plants. And some plants are really loving these extended summers. So, you know, now the pollen season is on average three weeks earlier. And we used to get a killing frost here in the Northeast. We would get a killing frost, say, around late October, early November. You know, this year we didn't get one until January. And it, and it was only a couple of days. And so things, uh, the plants are loving some of this, but they're producing more pollen and more potent pollen. And so poor allergy sufferers who might have been tolerating ragweed up till now are now starting to succumb. So you can see those people who have always had it are suffering more than ever. And those of us who had no problem are starting to find that we do have a problem. And so I like to say that it's just uh, a situation where our immune cells are trying to tell us, hey, we don't like it here. <laughs> We've done so many changes and really we haven't taken into account that that the changes that we make externally are going to have internal consequences. And that's really what we're seeing with the rise of allergies over the last, since really post-World War II, we've just seen them skyrocket all around the globe. And I think that's an indication that something we're doing is really making our immune cells unhappy and the rise in autoimmune disorders you, you can track that and you know some cancers i mean the immune system is also involved in cancer and so you have a tripartite you know we've been seeing younger and younger cancers and there's really no quote unquote reason we're not sure why a 30 to 39 year old will develop colon cancer now and we could expect them to not develop it until their 50s 20 years ago Something's going on, and I think the immune system is probably a key component of that story. So I think this is my last question, um, and you just set it up beautifully. I mean, over and over in the book, there's I experienced this sort of growing sense of dread as you made clear how many components there are to the rise of allergy and how many things are sort of against us, but might be our fault. Like we, we talked about genetics, genetics is not your fault, but um, you know, but allergy is genetics and environment and climate change and greenhouse gases and the rise in pollution and the change in our lifestyles. And as you talked about the, the, growing gap between the rich and poor, between people who can live in more privileged and safer environments and people who can't. Right. And so you you end the book with what I think is a really moving call to, to, to transform as many of those factors as possible. You position allergy as a social disease, that what really causes allergy is being human. And, and I would love to hear you talk for a minute about that sense of allergy as sort of a measure of equity, of how we are not doing enough really to take care of our fellow beings and, and how we might, if we want to solve allergy, we might need to change that. Right, because you're poor, you know, the poor people that struggle with allergies watching this and listening to this, they know full well there's only so much they can do by themselves. So if you have a respiratory allergy or asthma and you're allergic to tree pollen, 
and we're only planting male trees because the female trees are messy, huh. um, which in most cities, yeah, mostly we have historically planted male trees, which pump out more pollen because they don't have the seed pods. Like, so female trees drop. Oh. Yeah, so they're messy. It, it messes up the sidewalk and, and pollen doesn't. So that we, that kind of thing, um, you know, a, they can't do anything about that. That's not a decision they've made. And for a food allergy person, you know, they need a whole community to help keep them safe. Like they need, you know, they go to a restaurant, they need everyone in that restaurant to help them keep safe from their allergen, like to avoid their allergen. Um, and so it's really asking, you know, especially here in the U.S., we like to pretend that all of our problems are individual and can be solved with individual things. And so you're getting questions like, what can I do? Well, not much, but what can we do? A lot. We can start measuring smaller than 2.5 particles. Like it, we have the science, it's very easy to measure um, one um in diameter. And just so listeners know, a red blood cell is five um, micrometers wide. And we're talking about measuring something um, five times as small as that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible to do it. We have the technology that we've decided not to. So maybe we should decide to. So we could really tamp down on air pollution. We could do something about climate change um, more dramatically so that we're not dealing with the effects of wildfire smoke and mold is a huge problem for people who have asthma and for young children in their risk of developing something getting older. So climate change is already having an effect on our younger generation. So we can get more serious about that. And we can actually ask ourselves questions. Should we, we what types of plants should we be planting in our neighborhood? Um, you know, thinking about pollen as a, as a group, like you might really like your ornamental bushes, but if they're a public health hazard, maybe swap them out with something that produces less pollen or is more native to the area and less likely to cause problems. Um, so we can do some of this work together. And plastics, we could regulate some of the plastics. Um, we could regulate, um, right now, it just has to list fragrance. We don't know what's in a fragrance, so it's really hard to tell sometimes what you're allergic to. We could get better on that. So I think I would like us to, to design policies for everyone, but also to start thinking of ourselves as a colony, because part of the problem is we're not making our microbiomes happy. Hmm. And so we have to start making decisions like I might want the potato chips, but what my gut wants is a salad. <laughs> my My bacteria are really... And they should get a say because they are helping us. And so just changing that mindset that we're all these little individual units and we're all responsible for our health. No, we're all responsible for each other's health at this point. And, and again, to go back to the canaries in the coal mine, um, what you said at the beginning is completely true. Somebody might be watching this and go, well, I don't have an allergy. And I would say dot, 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 yet. <laughs> That was a great wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you for this fantastic book and for this tour through the history of allergy and the and um, the the dread that you have produced in me about what's going to happen next. I hope it's productive dread, though. If you're going to feel dread, <laughs> I hope that we can all harness it and use it to make to put pressure on people who actually can change things. Let us hope for that. Teresa, thank you so much thank for you. coming in our series. And that is it for this episode of the Health Storytelling Author Q&A series. Please consider following Teresa on social media. You can find her as Teresa McPhail on Twitter or X and Blue Sky and Dr. Teresa McPhail on Threads and Instagram. And buy her book, which you can find at the site of her publisher, Penguin Random House, and at Amazon, of course. 
and also at bookshop.org, which is the anti-Amazon. It's a B Corp, a social corporation for good that will accept your order for the benefit of independent bookstores, which is a thing that we love. And if you like actually going to bookstores, we urge you to follow the link we provide for IndieBound.com. That site will show you which independent bookstore near you is carrying Teresa's book or can order it for you. So come back in April when we'll hear from Christine Yu about Up to Speed, the groundbreaking science of women athletes. And if you've missed any episode of this series, which is several years old at this point, you can find them all archived on YouTube at the account of Emory's Center for the Study of Human Health. The center is our sponsor, and we are co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, Science Gallery Atlanta, and the Decatur Book Festival. We're grateful to all of them. And behalf of all of our sponsors, and from me, thank you for watching. Come back next month.